Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. The new film, Monsters and Men, explores the ripple effects many communities across this country face when a friend, a neighbor, or a family member is killed by excessive force used by the police. The, okay. the director, Ronaldo Marcus Green, beautifully weaves together three stories of men living in proximity to a tragedy and how that tragedy affects the choices they'll make for their lives and the future of those around them. Let's take a look. Let's count together. One, two, three. Whoa! Six. Let's go. Getting cold over here. Six, baby. Let's get it. Is there nothing better to do on a Monday night? Sir, step back, please. Back. All right, sir. Just step back, please. Right there. All right. And now walk her home anyway. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. This organization has seen quite a bit of you, and we really like you. And I believe 100% you're going to go in the first round. You know, I feel like everywhere I go, I'm reminded of what happens. What's happening about that shooting? And if he wasn't resisting arrest, he'd still be here. Yes. So if I resist arrest, you're going to shoot me? I know what you think you saw. Start in trouble now, do a disservice to everybody. When cop goes too far, now we're all guilty. Is that what you're saying? Larson is just this month's victim. I want to get involved. Do what you do. So what do the police want with you? They didn't want me to keep quiet. I saw the tape. So what, you're going to go blab about it? They're going to make an example out of you. What should I do? I just got a new job. I'm about to graduate. Everything's going to change if you just put this out there. Well, what would you do? What would you do if somebody twice your size is coming at you? He was surrounded by six or eight cops. Eight seconds, Lisa. He's dead. Cities are gonna keep burning. No, Kids are gonna keep getting shot. You're under arrest. I didn't do nothing. The cops are gonna keep getting off. Oh, you have a ticket out. You have no idea. You don't have a clue what goes on on the streets. You see three minutes of a shaky video, and you think you know what you do. Everybody, please welcome Calvin Harrison Jr., Shante Adams, John David Washington, and writer-director Ronaldo Marcus Green of Monsters and Men. Let's hear it. Thank you. Congratulations on this incredibly powerful film and uh, daring film, not just daring because of the story that you're trying to tell, but the way in which you have decided to tell this story. Uh, I think very few people would, one, have the bravery to attack this the way that you have and to go about it with this kind of structure. So tell me, when did this structure come, this idea of three separate stories around the same neighborhood? When did that come to you? Yeah, uh, the, sh the short story is I, I made a short film in 2015 called Stop. It was a nine-minute short film, uh, and I cast a friend of mine who's a New York City police officer. That short went to Sundance, and uh, my friend came, came with me, who's also a cop, and we were at Sundance celebrating the short film that we had gotten into the festival, and we started talking about the Eric Arner case in Staten Island. We were both from Staten Island. I used to deliver the pizza in that neighborhood, and... One thing led to another. What started out as a regular conversation ended in a pretty heated debate. What you see is the... the Between you and him. Between him and I, yeah. We, I, I saw a guy that should still be alive, and he saw it as sort of unfortunate that he was dead, but that he was resisting arrest. And so we kind of got into a, a philosophical debate about what's resisting, what's not, and, and how far can you take and all this stuff. And the conversation sat with me, and what I realized, what I didn't have in my short film, my nine-minute short film, was perspective. I didn't have the police perspective. Um, and so six months later, I, I sat down and was like, this is a way I can take this short film, still talk about the issues that were relevant in it, and expand on it. And so that's, that's how the triptych was born, was through that, you know, this idea that I can, I can go into another character. Uh, I, can, I can hear that side for, for a short, short period of time. Um, and that's, that's kind of, I went down that rabbit hole of, of, of that conversation and how that I, can, I, I can expand my short film. And, and Really, it's a triptych of, of births in a lot of way. In a lot of ways, we get the birth of a, a criminal at the hands of the police, really, in one. We get the birth of a man sort of finally addressing his place and the role that he plays uh, in his occupation. We get the birth of an activist in these three triptychs. I'm wondering, did you, did you happen to see it that way in terms of like what this tragedy, how it, how it 
created these new people and new lives for them? Yeah, I mean, I tried to simplify it in the sense that I, you know, um, I was just thinking about, again, going back to the short film about this young African-American kid that was walking home from baseball practice. And that kid was me. And I was like, how do we get to a place? You know, I have got, you know, two master's degrees, but at, at night with a hood on, like I'm just, you know, I'm a threat in my own community and that's a problem. But how do we get to that as a society? That's kind of where we are. Um, and so, you know, the, the videotape, I just kept going back to, I just kept going back to videotape as a catalyst, like, okay, wow, but what happened to those people that put those videotapes out there? Um, how do we, you know, how, how, how do we get the to- The Eric Garner tape? Is yeah, the Eric Garner, Garner, yeah, to yeah. Well, we know one. what happened to the, the, the young man who, who videotaped Eric Garner. He was harassed by the police and he was eventually arrested. Yeah, yeah, and then there, there were several cases after that. Walter Scott, the guy who videotaped that, you know, didn't want to come forward with the tape and because of what happened, you know, uh, to, the, to the guy in Staten Island. So, you know, there's several people that had videotaped these things, like, you know, uh, the woman that filmed uh, Philando Castile, you know, and with the baby screaming in the back seat, like, where is she? You know, where are these people? Um, and we kind of forget about those lives that are affected by it. And so I just thought that that was an interesting thing. You know, we, we, we turn on the news and we see what happens. We see the killings. But we, you know, we, we rarely get to spend time with the individuals that are affected by those scenarios. And so I just thought that that was an interesting, you know, sort of entryway into sort of the birth that you're talking about. How do we get to this situation? How do we get to a young black man walking home getting stopped by police and what do we do about it? You know, I, you know, it was just a way to kind of tackle it in a way that I, we hadn't seen it before. It's a thing that forces people to reevaluate themselves and oftentimes recreate who, who they are, who they know themselves to be. Uh, John, this is the this is obvious thing is that this is your second time playing a cop really this year and a kind of conflicted cop, third. Yeah. What was the? Old man in the gun. Oh, oh, old man in the gun too. As conflicted uh, about being a cop and old man in the gun? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> is this just a coincidence? Um, you know, it was it was a blessing, is what it was. Um, I was before research. I was so ignorant to the experience of an African American police officer in this country, and uh, I was sort of on one side of the argument, once you know, or, or the cause, you know, or whatever. So. Um, once I got to do my research and got to meet these men and women that are serving us, serving their community, uh, I took a, you know, a moment of pause, and uh, I started to become a, a bit encouraged on uh, the number of people that I got to see that really care about the community or doing it the right way. It's such a thankless job. So I had that motivation going into the film, knowing that I have to represent these people because they don't necessarily have the platform like they should, the platform that the ones that aren't doing their job to have. You know what I mean? So um, it was a it was a blessing to be able to uh, to step into those shoes. I imagine from a purely selfish standpoint, it was a great opportunity for acting because. Great acting is all about juxtaposition and all about conflicts and really what you're dealing with both in, in Black Klansmen and with, in, and with Monsters and, and Men are uh, men that are dealing with a certain kind of internal conflict that goes along with the occupation that they've taken up and where the, how the community views them and how they view themselves. Sure. I mean, um, being a black man in this country, I mean, there's, there's just a plenty of conflict and, and uh, opportunity to, to, to find resistance. So, um, yeah, that being said, along with the occupation that these men have, um, you know, are they too, they're not blue enough, they're not black enough for their community. Those kinds of discussion I hope these films raise and, and uh, make people aware of and that we can start discerning for ourselves and start being able to, to be more specific in our arguments or in our contention. What was it like to be able to uh, represent cops also doing good things? In this film, we get to see your character really engaging with the community. It's something that's not talked about often that, you know, beat cops are oftentimes engaged with the community that they, that they, that they serve and protect. Yeah, again, I was unaware of it. Uh, my first, I did about a month uh, worth of ride-alongs, my first day on the job. Um, I, 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 we're playing basketball with kids in Brooklyn, and then we get a call. Marcy Projects, and, and I saw a guy literally bleeding out. He almost died. So that, I mean, it was when, within five minutes of each other. That was my first day. That's the job. You know, I, I had many sleepless nights that month because the stuff I, I was seeing and, and how human beings treat each other, you know what I mean, and how we interact. And, and it was just, I, when, when I got all that in my spirit, I, I was becoming a bit stressed out from that, not even the character or the role, and I was able to bring that into the role. I mean, I was even looking, I was like, man, I look kind of beat up. You know, like uh, the guy does, and I don't think that's on purpose. You know that because he's he's so conflicted. I imagine that really helped with that scene 
uh, that we see a bit of in the trailer where you're arguing with somebody about your role as a police officer and how they're perceived and how this woman perceives you, that's very much coming from a kind of course in place of you don't see the things that I see. You don't know what I go through on a daily basis. Yeah, I mean, uh, the interviews that I conducted, which I can't share with anybody, but um, I, I put in into the into the character. I put it into this movie as much as I could. I wanted to honor that. I wanted to give it, give them a platform to be able to, to stay, because they don't, can't necessarily say that, although they should. You know, I think, uh, again, the more information we can get, I think, you know, maybe we can bridge that gap with the communication. Shantae, from, from, from Queens to bed right? With Roxanne, Roxanne to this. No, I can't get out of New York. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. Uh, pl just make New York movies. You represent us very well. Uh, how did you get involved with Monsters and Men? Had you already made Rox Roxanne, Roxanne? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we... Uh, they, I, we shot them a year apart. So we shot Roxanne, Roxanne in 2016 and then uh, Monsters of Men in 2017. And uh, yeah, me and Ray sat down, had a coffee, talked about the script. And I remember finishing the script and just having to sit with it for a moment because it was something that I haven't read before. And anytime I can find a script that is giving a voice and telling a narrative that we haven't heard, I'm always so interested in. And Zoe, just I was drawn to her immediately. I'm always drawn to characters that I'm inspired by, and Zoe is definitely one of those characters. She is strong, and she fights for people who can't fight for themselves. And that's the kind of person I want to be. So it was an honor to be able to step into those shoes. Um, Zoe definitely is, uh, you know, fighting for people that can't fight for themselves. But I think I feel like going from Roxanne, Roxanne to this. Last time I'll say that mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you're going with someone who has an incredibly powerful voice to another person who has a really powerful voice, yeah. but in a different way. What do you think it is about you that makes directors feel like that's you and you have that in you? <laughs> I don't know, Ray. What is it? <laughs> you might have to ask the directors that. But I mean, all I can say is that I am honored to be able to step into the shoes of characters like Shantae, characters like Zoe, who are fighters and survivors and who aren't afraid to say what they feel and what they mean and let you know how it is. Um, because oftentimes, black women are silenced in those ways. So it's an, it, like I said, it's an honor to be able to play characters like Shantae and Zoe. And you're also, you're kind of representing uh, a, a group of people, a group of women in this country right now who are really big activists and their voices are becoming bigger and louder, uh, very importantly. Um, did you feel any kind of pressure or were you worried about, worried about how you would represent them? Um, not so much pressure, but I did wanted to make sure that I invoked their spirit. Ray had us watch a documentary, Who's Streets, before we started filming, and... Um, the Fer that's the Ferguson doc, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 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 and one of the main cast in that doc, Brittany Farrell, was a really big inspiration to me when I was going through the work and just watching her videos and how passionate she was every day and just watching the videos of the likes of Amanda Seals and Angela Rye, like people who are more so on the forefront of this fight because uh, what I learned was people who voluntarily put that burden on their back, that is something really powerful because they could coast, they could ignore all of these things that are going on, but they voluntarily choose to wake up and fight every day and that was just so, so intriguing to me. Hey, Calvin, your character uh, is really the kind of, the person who we see have a massive change and put all of it on the line without trying to give anything away. Sorry, no spoilers here. Uh, what was it like? I mean, did you look at uh, a lot of professional athletes right now who are also doing that? Did you take that into consideration in your performance? No, actually. <laughs> I honestly base most of it on just like my conversations with Ray and like his baseball background. And I did the training and we kind of just talked about the culture and, and what it means to be a young man in America and to be 17 and not have all the answers and be trying to figure that out in the moment every day. And so that's, we just kind of, we went from there, yeah. It's like, Ray, it seemed like using this character was a way for you to get into that conversation without sort of directly being in that conversation. Because once you kind of get so far in and become too direct, I think people tune it out. But because you have this young man who's going through a change, they can relate to it before they get into that conversation. Is that where this player came from? Or was it mostly just about your experience being a, a, a young baseball player? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it evolved for sure. I mean, I took you know, my upbringing, I had two major league tryouts and 
That's as far as I got. What did uh, you try out for? The Mets and the Cincinnati Reds. Um, I got, uh, yeah, those... Some tough tryouts. I got hit, got hit around pretty hard. Uh, you got hit I was a pitcher. I was a pitcher. Oh, wow. Uh, you got slammed. You got yeah, slammed. I was, yeah, I, was, I wasn't, uh, yeah, the, the gas wasn't happening that day. Just, you know, <laughs> watching the ball go in the field. Like, oh, well, Dad, I think next year I uh, so have, <laughs> have to get a couple more miles an hour in the fact. I was throwing hard, but I was, like, right over the plate. It was, like, I wasn't hitting spots or anything like that. I'm going to go completely tangential here for a minute. I'm really sorry, but th I think this is fascinating. Did you expect to become, like, a professional baseball player when you were in high school? Was that the trajectory that you were planning? Yeah, like, I, my, my dad was, like, Serena Williams' father. Like, it was, like, he was going to make he was gonna make a professional. So this is, I think this is important because we only hear about the Serena Williams. We don't hear about the person who watched the balls get hit over the fence and had to be like, okay, I got to come up with plan B. Yeah, like, if I struck out in a game, you know, looking, it was, like, I mean, it was like penalties at home. You know, we had to come home and take 200 swings in the living room. Like, it, my dad was, was pretty intense. He would watch 162 games a, a year, plus, you know, uh, reruns and postseason play. Like, he was in, he was in it to win it. I mean, I, I actually, it was funny because I, I, you know, joking, my father, you know, rest his soul, has passed on. But, um, but you know, I was like, you know, if he was a Yankee fan, he might still be alive, you know, because they win all the time, you know. But <laughs> we're like Mets fans, you know, and like that, 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 you know, and uh, diehard Mets fans, literally. Uh, and we just, you know, it takes a toll on the life, you know, it takes a toll when you, when you care so much. No, seriously, when you, when you invest your life in, in a sport, because it, baseball to him was how he communicated. There's a scene in the film where Rob Morgan, who plays his father, yeah. the only way he could communicate with him was telling him situational baseballs. And that's the way my dad would, whether it was, you know, uh, you know, relationships. He would just talk. He would talk, and well, you gotta wait for the curveball and hit it to right. Like, Dad, you're talking about a girl. You're talking about a, a, a woman in a relationship right now. He's talking about curveballs. You he know? also can't understand any kind of emotional attachment to anything outside of the ambition towards, but professional baseball exactly. or a scholarship. Exactly. But what was it like? I am curious. What? When did you come up with the plan B? And how did you decide that? When did that come? Well, I just. Oh well, the plan B happened naturally. I, I wasn't good enough, and you know, to make it to the next level. You know, I, I went home the off season. I thought I had a, sh a shot, and I worked out like crazy. I was like, you know, I'm this close. You know, I had two major league tryouts. I'm 19. Next year is the year. I went. You know, I, I put in the extra work, but you know, I. I, I got weaker. I didn't actually get stronger. Yeah, I put on muscle mass, but I didn't actually learn to pitch any better, you know, I, I, yeah, I didn't have the right coach maybe at the, at the time. So uh, plan B was, you know, I, I became a teacher. I taught kindergarten through fifth grade, then I worked on Wall Street for a few years, and then I've kind of left that to, to become a filmmaker. Um, so I tried lots of different things before, before you know, venturing. I like that film. story more than Serena Williams' story, to be <laughs> honest. With you. I love Serena Williams, but I like, I like the plan B stories a lot more. I think they're more important for people to hear. Uh, John, you know, uh, your, your other film this year, which we briefly mentioned, Black Klansman, uh, directed by uh, the god Spike Lee, um, is, uh, he is, he's the greatest of all time. Uh, no offense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <I'm taken. laughs> Watch one of his movies. They're amazing. <laughs> no, you got to explain it, man. We, we get it. <laughs> I heard someone laugh, and I was like, I don't understand why we would laugh at that. Oh, the God. I just, I just never heard it like that. The God. I was, I was oh, like with you. Father. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and the movie is doing incredibly well. I think better than anybody had anticipated or hoped uh, it would do. Uh, and it's it, rightfully so. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's powerful. What is it like to be a part of something like that that uh, didn't just sort of try to be a part of it, made itself a part of the conversation? Um, I mean, I feel like, you know, for people of color, we're all, stand in this industry, we're all standing on his shoulders. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to be a part of that, his rich history is, is the, the biggest blessing I've ever, uh, one of the biggest blessings I've ever received. So um, it's given me an extreme amount of confidence, but also working with Ronaldo as well has given me the extreme amount of confidence that I didn't even realize I needed, the trust from these directors that I, I'm not, I wasn't used to. I wasn't used to a uh, director trusting me with the material. And for Ray, especially in this film, um, you know, it was very personal to him. You know, we would talk about it. We worked it on Sundance Labs and talked about what was at stake here and just how much we cared and, and the process of it all. So it was, it was like, I mean, I come from a sports background too. It was like running through a brick wall for your coach. You know, that gave me motivation. I love the fact that he cared that much because I care this much about the craft. And so even when working with a Spike Lee, he still cares and still has this sort of youthful exuberance approach to the, to the, to the work, to the process. So this man who's accomplished so much, he still cares and laughing and yelling at the same time at you and, f and, f and for you. Uh, don't take it personally, never do. Um, you know, it just, that's, that's contagious. 
And so you, you just go with it, and, and it was the most fun, you know, I, I've had. I mean, just because of the trust factor. I mean, it, the environment that he uh, and, and Spike created was a, a, a collaborative environment. And uh, from the actor's perspective, it doesn't happen so often. And when it does, there's some things that, that were in you that you didn't realize you can bring out. But you can bring out because you're not thinking about anything else. You know, you're protected. And when you're protected and trusted, the stuff that you sort of prepare, that you try to prepare for, anticipate, but you can't, and you just notice and, and feel the moments that are happening, that's the magic. That's why I watch movies in the first place. That's why I got into the business. Because uh, either it's a form of escapism or it's somebody I can relate to that I'm seeing on that screen in their truest form. And I, I feel that way when, you, when you're performing for people that, that believe in your abilities. Different types of performance, though, uh, I would say, when it comes to working with Spike and working with Ronaldo. With Ronaldo and Monsters of Men, I find, or just as a viewer, I found that the camera is sitting with the actor a lot, really trying to like exist and allow them to breathe and find things within the moment. And with Spike, and especially with Black Klansman, it's a dark comedy. So so it's moving, it's punchy, and the actors kind of have to work in that performance, in that in that um, in that box as well. Um, yeah, I mean that, that's great. I, I I agree too. A lot of the quiet moments that were happening in Monsters and Men, uh, they're, they're very. It's, it's so palpable though. You can feel what they're going through without any words. And sometimes as an actor, that's great when it's not the dialogue you have to del have to deliver but you just have to exist in reality in the truth of what's going on the circumstances that are happening i didn't have a comedic approach to spike lee's film uh, we, we weren't playing it as a comedy we were very honest and true to the story and uh the humor the hilarity comes out of how ridiculous this story is but we were on the foundation of truth you know this happened you know we we're standing on history in a way so that tonally, I think you know. I think Spike is a master of tone. So knowing that, if you just play it honest and true, the right thing, the right uh, product will come out. The truest one will come you out. You weren't thinking of comedy when you did the kung fu thing and the and the. <laughs> have you, uh, do you, are you familiar with the records room? Like it's like, have you ever been in an office space and you're just like you've had it? You you might think about going postal on somebody. I mean, that's that moment. That's that moment. I mean, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of fun. It's fun, but it's like he was serious. He, he, yeah, he was sick of it, you know. And 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 that happened over the course of years. So that moment, you know, for cinematic purposes, you got to tighten it up. And that was right after uh, the uh, the actor came. The the basically the asshole of the department the, had the just toads right? comment. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Think about that. For years, that's happening. Not just you know a couple minutes in the film. So you know, I have to consider that this has been happening for a long time. So. I've had it, and then and, you know the character had it, and you know he was influenced on kung fu films that were a part of the culture back then. So uh, all that goes into it. Ronaldo, where uh, where did you find the the style that I kind of mentioned of sort of sitting with your actors and sitting with them? I mean, just right from the top of the film when we're in the car, it's very much about watching this person exist within the world until something happens around them. Where did you where did you find that going into this? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think you know. Thanks. Uh, you know, I, 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 I think in trying to find out what kind of filmmaker I was, this, you know, I, I made a couple of short films, and I think, you know, out of those shorts, a, a style was being formed. Um, you know, I, I was, I had done a couple little short docs, you know, between documentary, and I like that line between documentary and fiction, and and what's real and what's not, and. And so I wanted to keep a lot of that same approach here and let things sort of breathe and, and, and unfold. Um, it's just something that I've learned over the last couple of years of going to film school and you know my personal taste and one of the things that I kind of like. Um, and it kind of, it's evolving organically uh, is probably the best answer I can, I can give. Um, you know, I think there is that sort of doc feel uh, to the film. Uh, but I didn't want the film to be a documentary. I wanted to f to be elevated. How do I elevate sort of the the things that I love about a documentary? The the good thing about fiction is that you can change your fate. Uh, you know, sometimes if a documentary is so true, it's just it, it is what it is. You know, and here we can we can show. You know, we can we can play with it a little bit, and we can we can change that narrative. Um, we have the ability to do that. Um, so I just wanted to keep that truth and and you know that stillness. Some of the qu most quiet scenes in the film are the loudest, um, and and there's something very powerful about silence. Um, and I think, 
you know, when you watch the film and you, and you, and you have those moments of just reflecting or a character can just sit there, I think that's just the most, it's some of the most powerful stuff you can watch. Yeah, there's something very observational about your approach to the, to the story here. You feel like a, I wouldn't say a detached observer, but a somewhat removed observer rather than really uh, punctuating and, and pushing what we're supposed to hear and see. Let's get some uh, questions from the audience. Who has a question? Right here, hi. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Um, my question is for Ronaldo. It, you said that after you spoke to a police officer, you gained perspective on what the other side thinks. Has that changed your opinion? I mean, I felt very uncomfortable with the conversation. Um, I still feel uncomfortable about it. I don't agree with it. Um, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't hear it out. And I think, you know, oftentimes on in social media, you know, somebody you don't like what they're saying, you just you just unfollow them or you just take them off your feed and we just we surround ourselves around people that make us feel good in our sort of bubble. But that's how, you know, that's how elections are won or lost. Um, and I think if we stay insulated, we can't, you know, kind of move past. You know, we have to kind of hear the other side to move forward. Um, so it was important for me to check myself, really check my own biases about how I feel about certain things um, and investigate it. You know, that's kind of how I took that approach. Um, you know, I invited my police officer friend back into the film. He's part of the, he's, you know, we, he also was taking a step towards me. You know, we had a lot of support from the NYPD. Uh, you know, in order to do those ride-alongs, we have to get permission. We had to share our script. This none, none of this was like flying under the radar. Like we had support. You know, this is not. You know, we're trying to to find an understanding, a mutual ground. That's what the film is trying to do. And you I think share, you had to share your script with the NYPD. Or yeah, we had to with for departments in order to get a, a ride along. Yeah, absolutely. We 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 shared our script. Um, you know, there are New York po City police officers in the film. Uh, we had consultants uh, who were actually part of part of uh, our process in terms of the research. So I mean, we had we had full support at least within the divisions that we were working with. You know, within Borough North, we had we had several police officers that came to set visit. We have photo. I mean, it's, it was open. It was a very open process. Um, you know, as you can see in the dinner scene, you know, it's showing a different perspective. You know what I mean? We're not necessarily condemning. It's just the way. It's just the way it is at this moment. And so I think, again, it's just, it was about trying to find that, find some kind of common ground so that we can move the conversation forward. Um, I don't necessarily know what the answer is, uh, but that's, that's what the film is about. The film doesn't necessarily condemn uh, anybody, but we do live in a very bifurcated time where it's like, if you're not with us, you're against us from, from both sides quite often. Were you worried that being so uh, open to the police department that that would lead to criticism from the other side who you were also trying to give voice to as well? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it, there's, it's, it's a no win sometimes. You know, uh, the police officer who is a friend of mine is a white police officer. So when we had the conversation, um, you know, I was like, oh, if I make this film, you know, if I'm making the film, I was thinking about it. And I said, you know, if I make him a white cop, it's going to be solely about race. It's going to be a black and white thing. And I didn't want that to get lost because we're talking about the, we're talking about something deeper than that, you know, bigger than that. We're talking about a culture of police. Um, and to me, it was more interesting to, to see, you know, to talk about the issue rather than it being, oh, it's a black or white. Uh, it's about the gray area in which we're exploring in this film. Um, and I thought this was the best approach in order to do that in my, you know, in, 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 in what I thought was, you know, a way of moving the conversation forward. John, did you engage with the officers that you went on ride-alongs with in conversations about, about this? Yeah, I, d I did. Um, and I got to kind of keep it in-house, you know, yeah. you know, because um, out of respect. Um, and yeah, like uh, I'll piggyback off. Some of it was very uncomfortable. Some of it was extremely uh, encouraging. And um, that they g gave me hope. And what I actually got to see, the form of communication within the neighborhoods that they were patrolling was very positive, very interactive. So um, I, I didn't know that. Even playing basketball with these kids, which didn't seem staged or set up because I was going. This was like a thing. This is what they do. And the kids knew them well, called them by their names. That was encouraging. You know, so um, finding, you know, I said it before, finding the, the, the language of coexistence. I think hopefully people 
can get inspired to find it after they see this film. Next question. Hi, thanks for coming out. Um, this is just more of an open-ended question for all of you guys. Um, with this film, how do you want it to like affect the conversation around this like delicate and like very deeply tragic issue? I I want for these people to be included in the conversation now. I think that the beauty of this film is that we are giving a voice to people that we often don't think about after incidents like this happen. The people, the person who recorded it, the the community members that are affected, the the cop that you know um, can be conflicted with being black and being on the force. So I hope that their stories are now included in the conversation, and um, that we pay attention and listen to them. Ellen, what what about you, especially in regards to portraying an, uh, an athlete going through something like this? A young, not just an athlete, also, but maybe just like a young man who's coming to who who's changing and becoming an activist. We're seeing. Uh, many, many more young people become activists right now? Yeah, I mean, I think growing up in this, I guess, day and age, like, I look at my own life, and I kind of see, you know, I look at Zarek's, and I look at mine, and we come from this this good family to an extent. You know, Zarek has his dad, but he's taking care of him, and he's kind of prevented him from maybe to see all the horrors of our, of our world sometimes, and that means he did a good job parenting, but then there's that moment when you grow up, and you walk outside and you kind of go, I'm not an anomaly and I'm not exempt from this experience. And just because I got a good upbringing doesn't mean that I'm not, I'm not going to feel like, like an outcast for some reason. So, you know, stepping into that is, a, is, a, is an awakening. You know, I, I had an awakening with Ray. I had an awakening that I wanted to do something and that I felt, I, I felt that I had a voice and I shouldn't live in fear. And I think now that's what we're kind of discovering and that there's no right or wrong way to participate in these conversations. It's just about doing what you feel is right and that your experience is valid, like Shante said. So that's kind of what I think this new, I guess, forward motion of what young people are feeling is this. And I think what this movie will help with is that, wow, I can do something and that what I'm doing is enough. One thing that I think the movie uh, shows without really, really, um trying to say is how diverse these institutions that we are critical of actually are in a lot of ways. And as, many, as much as there are systemic issues within them, deep systemic issues, because there are deep systemic issues within this country, <laughs> uh, these institutions, the military, the police force, are often very diverse. And we see that in John's character's relationship with his, with his white female partner and it's not something that we ever that I think we ever talk about we just always imagine that these institutions are as bifurcated as we are in our personal lives as well was that something intentional on your part to show yeah I mean absolutely we yeah, you know, sure <laughs> yes uh, yeah why not uh, no I mean yeah it, it definitely you know when we boil it down it's just the way the, the numbers shook out in this one but um you know, I, I'm I'm half Puerto Rican. I'm half African American. I wanted to represent that in this film. Anthony Ramos, Puerto Rican. You know, I, I wanted to show the different, the diversity, the diversity in my culture. You know, the New York I grew up in, the New York I know, the different families. I want to say, oh, what's behind door number one? Anthony Ramos. There's there's, you know, uh, platanos on the stove. You know, there's like you know, I wanted to, I wanted you to smell that. You know, I wanted you to feel that a little bit. It's a little, little taste. You know, we don't get to see Puerto Ricans on screen. You know, and it just was you know, or Dominicans. You know, I just wanted to show that. I wanted to have a little piece of that. Um, so yeah, it's just you know it's sort of the upbringing I had, and and you know again just to, just just the you know how the numbers shook out in this one, but uh, we weren't I wasn't necessarily thinking diversity, you know I was just thinking this is my life and this is the the New York I know. Well, guys, uh, I love the film. Congratulations, it's beautiful, a wonderful achievement. Uh, it opens this Friday, right? People can go see it. Yeah. Opens this Friday. Everybody, give a big round of applause for Thank everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's hear it. Thank you.